Trepang 2. What is it? Naturally, you're here and this channel is about video games, so it's a video game, but why is it named after sea cucumbers? After playing the game, I searched far and wide for the deep philosophical meaning behind the name, and my conclusion is that I wasted my time, and I am now more knowledgeable about the reproductive cycle of sea cucumbers. So anyways, what is Trepang 2, for real? To answer that, we need to go back to an age where they took Nicolas Cage's face off in Face Off. But first, the basics. This is a single player first person shooter with horror elements. So the late 90s and the early 2000s were a paradise for action movies. A lot of them didn't change the world, but they were a fun time. John Woo was a Hong Kong director that really set a trend in that era. I'll tell you what he did and you can tell me what movies he directed. You ready? Bombastic shootouts with sparks and debris flying everywhere. Dual wielding 9mm pistols. An emphasis on movement in gunfights, usually involving diving, sliding on the ground or some other acrobatic stunt. Pauses in action where two rivals stand off at gunpoint. So anyways, I gave you a freebie, but tell me your favorite John Woo movie in the comments. But Liv, where are you going with this? Well, I think it's fair to say that John Woo did a lot to shape the action sequences in movies, but in 2005, a first-person shooter released that embodied a lot of these principles in the gameplay. This game was fear. Without dwelling on it too much, the fear sequels didn't really stay true to the core principles that people would come to call Woo shooters. To this day, fear is well regarded and fairly unchallenged in this niche. Enter Trepang 2. Now, I wouldn't say that Trepang 2 competes with fear, but you can tell that the developers love fear and wanted to make a love letter. So what are these borrowed inspirations from fear? For one, Trepang 2's visuals, in particular dynamic lighting, is used a lot with harsh light sources like torches lying on the ground throwing deep shadows. The result is that everything has this incredible sense of depth. This is great for the scary moments, but it also just really looks good. I'm not throwing shade here, but Trepang Studios aren't running on a AAA budget. Some of the assets can be samey and repeated all over, but you put in some really good dynamic lighting and suddenly you have one of the best looking shooters with a thick atmosphere and you almost forget the stack of green boxes that you see in almost every level. Now, like I said, Trepang 2 is a woo shooter, so sparks are flying, there's smoke and debris, and people are just in the air. There's slow-mo and explosions and blood, and I'm almost tempted to say that we're not so much first person shooting as much as we're directing and playing our own badass action movie gunfight in first person. A lot of what you're doing is more concerned with chaining actions together and maintaining a flow. That's not to say it's easy. I played on hard, which is only the third difficulty option, and there are quite a few difficulties above it and I died plenty of times, but it's fun. I'm happy to report that Trepang 2 is a joy to play from moment to moment. I'm confident in saying that the gunplay is almost like sex. Not quite, but it's close. And AAA games should take note. Now, as Subject 106, you can carry two weapons on your person at any time and you are free to swap to any weapon you find lying on the ground. We're talking pistols, SMGs, assault rifles, DMRs, shotguns, minigun, grenade launcher, and bolt gun. Options wise, you have limited coloring customization and weapon attachments that you can pick up by searching through the levels. Some of these weapon attachments are minor and some of them are game changers. The guns in Trepang 2 just feel good, but the shotgun and the bolt gun really stand out for being badass. So yeah, this is good and all, up until the point that you get the serum. Don't ask me how injectables do this, but the serum gives you the ability to dual wield. Because of course, it's a woo shooter. And then suddenly everything goes from being good to being exceptional. The SMG goes from being a workhorse to just treading everything. The dual pistols are just a really stylish way to dome massive fools, but the winner in my opinion is still and always will be the dual spaz 12 shotguns that you single-handedly shake pump reload like you're the terminator. Also it becomes monstrous once you get the attachment for incendiary rounds. I suppose I should explain the bolt gun, it's a three round burst bolt gun, but these bolts are explosive. You quickly get an attachment that simply changes it into being a single mega bolt, but no explosive. The minigun is cool, but it has a long spin up and it just doesn't mesh well with the gameplay loop. Along with the DMR that wants you to hang back while every other mechanic wants you to charge in. 
Unlike most modern shooters, there's no aim down sights, and this is because the game is far more concerned with movement than precision, though there is a catch. You're not particularly fast and you have a stamina bar that drains quickly when you sprint or slide, sliding being the fastest burst of speed. The result is that you can do a lot of movement in short bursts, but you are incentivized to start in cover and end in cover, and when you think about it, it perfectly emulates the Wu formula. The caveat is that kills increase your stamina, allowing you to put together more actions so aggression is rewarded okay so we have some shooting and movement out of the way but what about the other stuff Trapang 2 has a basic stealth system crouch to move silently don't turn on the flashlight on your gun and stay behind cover and generally you won't be seen on top of this you also have invisibility camera stealth helps to get you in a good position but generally everything is going to devolve into a gunfight eventually so it works but it's not a cornerstone of the gameplay more than anything I found invisibility visibility camo to be a good exit strategy mid gunfight to give me a breather or a gap closer. Camo's nice and all but this isn't crisis. Subject 106 defining ability is the ability to perceive events in slow motion and gain a speed buff. This focus ability is built up by damaging and killing enemies and then spent at will. I don't think I need to explain this, it allows you to maim, kill and conduct a cinematic dance of death that never really gets old. We're not done yet though, we have melee attacks and grab attacks that you can weave in with slides and gunfire to take out enemies in style. So for example, you might focus, slide an enemy's legs out from under him, pump him with lead while he flies through the air, jump and kick the next guy in the head and shoot him to finish him off, and then show the third guy the butt of your gun before grabbing him as a hostage, pulling the pin of the grenade on his belt and tossing him to the next group of enemies, and then use camo to find cover and reload. I almost forgot about grenades. Grenades have a weird mirage effect. Fear had this too. But aside from that, what I like about them is that they are contact grenades, meaning if the grenade touches the enemy, they explode, which is really nice for keeping the flow going. There are a variety of throwable objects, though my favorite has to be the axe and throwing knives, which just feel badass. Now I just gave an example where we threw a man, and yeah we can yeet people like they're the consistency of a tennis ball, so I guess we need to talk about the story. Oh boy. Trepang 2 does a lot right, even aspects of the story, but it never really comes together. Without too much in the way of spoilers, you are imprisoned and placed in a wheelchair in front of a TV, someone breaks into your cell, and you escape. From there you escape the facility that you were imprisoned in with the aid of the Syndicate Task Force. The first major misstep here is that you get in the and the director of this task force just assumes and asserts that you want revenge against the people that imprisoned you. Bro, I want a shower and some ramen. Forget that noise. So anyways, you walk around the base where you can do some light customization for your clothes and guns, pick your starting supplies, run combat simulations, and read intel text dumps that you pick up while you're on mission. The syndicate task force base is your home and your home is empty and lifeless. The people that imprisoned you, the Horizon Corporation, are corrupt and evil scum that you need to kill. Or at least that's how it seems. There's a couple questions that are going to be running through your mind. The guy that frees you commits seppuku in a freezer and leaves a medallion. The other weird thing is that you don't take the sword. What's wrong with you? You will also occasionally come across these drones that give you a short encrypted message that sort of hint to the truth of things. From the second mission onwards, we run into more horror elements that are presumably experiments that the Horizon Corporation are conducting. As a setup, I was actually really invested in what was going on. I wanted to learn more about this world. What are Horizon doing? Who are the Syndicate? Why am I suddenly in the back rooms? How did I become a super soldier? Unfortunately, far too much of this is in text dumps and you can't force me. I'm not going to do it. And what's weird about it is that the voice acting in Trepang 2 is sensational. I have no idea why they didn't find a way to weave this information in the mission's comms. Like, there aren't a lot of missions, but I felt like they were pretty bulky in length. There is downtime where this kind of storytelling would make sense. You also often have squad members by your side having conversations, but they never use the moment to give the world depth. Audio drops would have been great too. And again, I'm baffled because the missions do such a great job of environmental storytelling with great pacing, especially the sub-area mission. 
The end result is that the story could be good, it could have a lot of depth, but there are these gaps between the major reveals and plot twists that leave large spaces before the story throws a fruity twist that pleads you to just accept what's going on. There's almost like there's too much story across too few missions that they felt they had to condense by removing what they felt was superfluous and then shoved it into text files. What I'm saying here is that there's good bones and Trepang 2 even excels in some aspects of storytelling but I think they need to let the story cook a little longer in the next one. But Liv, no one plays these games for the story, I hear you say. And sometimes I would agree, but I think the story is the one thing they have to get right in this particular instance, and I'm going to get to the why. But we need to talk about the sound and atmosphere first. Let's start with the soundtrack since this thing absolutely slaps and is gym playlist worthy. Like you're going to hit your PB next session. Your heart will absolutely be pumping with some of these harder tracks like Horizon Hail Mary. which syncs really well with the frantic slow-mo gunfights. I mean, some of these tracks are absolutely feral in the best way, though I'll admit that I'm an edgelord, so maybe some of this sounds a bit harsh for some tastes. I often find a lot of first-person shooters can dish out heavy blasting tracks, but don't know when to hold back and let the player simmer. This isn't the case in Trepang 2, where you often have quieter moments or building tracks like Lights Out. that are great interludes that build you up for the next encounter. Overall, I think the tone within the soundtrack is managed quite well and does a good job of scaling up and down with the gameplay. Sound effects in Trepang 2 are amazing. <laughs> So every time you're in combat you can hear the enemy's comms and you can hear what the enemies are saying. This is something that is inspired by fear and is awesome for a reason. Hearing the enemy's strategies about how they're going to corral you, flush you out and then take you down in such an official manner only to hear their confidence dissolve into disorganized confusion and panic as the reality of their situation sets in is a serotonin booster that really sells the magic of the action scene you're creating. The sound of gunshots, blood splatter, I mean, the sound of shooting someone's head off with a spaz 12 at point blank and then seeing their brain fly out just turns an average day into a good day. It's wet, it's sloshy and moist with a sharp crack followed by the pump. It's just grand and I can really say the same for all the guns and their sound effects. Outside of combat, the sounds are mostly appropriate, though I have one major complaint that was very annoying to me personally. Dead enemies persist in the level, and if you walk into them, the sound of their bodies knocking about is extremely loud and distracting to the point where I was purposely avoiding walking over bodies because it was so loud. That complaint aside, I want to get back to what this all has to do with the story. Trepang 2 has great atmosphere. Between the depth of the dynamic lighting, the soundtrack usage, the frantic enemy chatter, and generally great presentation, Trepang 2 just oozes with atmosphere of foreboding and chaos. This atmosphere is not for nothing. Trepang 2 does have some replayability in wave survival secondary missions. The killboard for bosses who are mostly just heavily armored soldiers unlock story drops and cheats, but at the end of the day this is a fairly brief single player experience and the combat is the only thing you do. The combat is awesome, but without the backdrop of the enemy's reactions, the mood and the awesome effects, it would get old pretty quickly. So the atmosphere does a lot, but having a compelling narrative with pieces like I don't need to understand everything, but pieces with reasonable leaps would do a lot to invest players and make the twists and turns into more memorable moments that people will want to talk about and relive. And because this anchor doesn't exist, but also begs to exist, Trepang 2 feels like a house that's missing a foundational pillar. Now I know I said the gunplay is like sex, but we need to talk about another missed opportunity here. There's quite a bit in the way of destructible objects, but it doesn't quite match its inspiration here. It can be a little weird with what they chose to be a physics object and what they chose to bolt down and it takes away from the immersion but not only that you can't use any of these objects I mean how cool would it be if you could kick a wheeled office chair into an enemy or kick a door down to flatten the guy behind it or maybe even throw an aerosol can and then shoot it midair I don't know I'm just spitballing here but I'd be lying if I didn't admit that the 
gameplay outside of your personal movement and gunplay is very limited in scope. And you can see all the ingredients are there to make some great sandbox moments, but they're just never capitalized on. So yeah, I might be coming down on Trepang 2 a little bit harsh since I recently reviewed Bright Memory Infinite and I could say the same things there, but I chose not to because they were far off elements. I bring them up here for Trepang 2 because a lot of these things are within arm's reach. So I hope Trepang Studios does well and Trepang 2 sells well and perhaps they might include some of these things in their next installment. Okay, so it's time to wrap things up here. Overall, Trepang 2 is a fantastic first person shooter that successfully applies the Wu shooter principles pioneered by fear. In fact, I think in a pure gameplay sense, this is the best one. If you're here for the action, the bullets, the slow-mo, dismemberment and a slice of horror, then this is the best game on the market. On the other hand, the brevity of the experience and the gaps in the story really hold it back from reaching the lofty heights that Trepang 2 aspires to. Gun to my head and its dual spaz 12s, I give Trepang 2 a 6.5 out of 10.